and a reminder that the session is being recorded. Um, so um, yeah, we are ready to move on. So we're gonna start with an overview of what the teaching portfolio is and review its purpose, its components, and the process of assembling it before we go into more detail about each of the components and uh, how to assemble them. So let's start with this and I'll ask you all to share your thoughts in the chat. It might seem like an obvious question, but there's actually a lot of answers. Why create a portfolio? Why even create a teaching portfolio in the first place? What do we think? <laughs> uh, Bill <laughs> brings a rather uh, realist approach. You could track our progress or lack of, very fair. Um, I, mean, I mean, I would say, you know, it's always important to see your own progress or see where you want to make more progress. Um, to reflect about our own teaching effectiveness, absolutely. Accountability, I love that, Sonia. Um, yeah, uh, document, absolutely. These are all excellent answers. Um, so on our slide, we lay out here a bunch of different reasons. Of course, the first one that might come to mind is tenure promotion job application, what we're talking about today. But there's a lot of other purposes that a portfolio can serve. So, for example, it is a record of teaching effectiveness, as folks mentioned in the chat. It's a really it's actually probably your best opportunity to reflect on your teaching and refine your practices. So the best way to grow as an instructor is to reflect on what you have done and tried and assess how it worked and what you want to do next time. So it's great as a metacognitive tool in that way, of course, to track your development development as a teacher, um, as a teaching professional over time to see your own growth across different forms of evidence and to share a public representation of yourself as a teacher with your students and colleagues. So portfolios can serve all of those different purposes and we ask you to keep that in mind as we talk about the components today. One more note here is that there are possible formats, different possible formats for submitting your portfolio. Um, what you could do is a continuous PDF document. You might also combine PDFs and links to larger media files. The main thing that we ask you to do or that um, you know the folks who are receiving the portfolios ask is for consistency with naming those documents. Um, Priya, is there anything that you would like to add here about format? Uh, no, I mean, I just one little addition, I would say on the naming of documents, if you're um, on the tenure track, then um, there's very specific guidance in the CFA DOF um, instructions memo um, for what every piece of the teaching portfolio should be called. So I definitely want to point you to that document, which you can find on the Dean of Faculty's website. You can also find it, I think, on the Faculty Senate website as well. Thank you, Priya. That's really helpful. All right. Um, so uh, sort of something we want to emphasize here is that the portfolio is not just a product that we deliver to others. The process of creating it is it has its own merit and value in that it helps us reflect on our teaching and helps us grow as instructors. So we see the portfolio as useful in process and product. Let's talk about some of the components of the AU file and teaching. And um, we, of course, have the comprehensive narrative. So that is going to include teaching, service, and currency in the field, which we are going to talk a little bit more about in a second. We also are going to include, of course, an updated CV, um, you know, to, to the date that you are submitting it. 
And then we have the teaching portfolio, which is a more expansive part. And that's going to include these components. And just a reminder that we're going to share the slideshow with uh, everyone who attended in our follow-up. So if you're worried about recording all of this, um, please don't. We will share all of these materials with you. Um, so of course, we start with a teaching statement, which you may have also heard as teaching philosophy, teaching value statement, teaching whatever, right? Um, the idea here is that you are going to talk about teaching in your comprehensive narrative, but you're also going to talk about teaching in your teaching statement. And so a recommendation there is to pull your teaching statement from your discussion of teaching in the comprehensive narrative. Um, additionally, you will include supporting materials. So you need to include all three of these types of assessment for promotion. For term reappointment, you would include just one or continuing appointment, you would include just one. And that self-assessment, peer assessment, and student assessment. And we're going to talk more about what each of those is and different options for them, but just an overview there that the portfolio should include, depending on what you are aiming for, at least one, one to three of those types of assessment. And then SET numerical scores. And just to remind you all, those are generated by OIRA. Um, they are, you do not uh, produce or process those scores. So you don't need to do anything to have those numerical scores. That is something that that office will offer for you um, to include. Um, one thing to keep in mind in this box inside is that one size does not fit all. Expectations may vary by department, school, and field. So we highly recommend that you stay in touch with your own unit and ask them what they are asking for as part of the portfolio, um, any sort of written guides they have about that to get insight from your peers who have gone through the process or are currently going through it. Please go ahead, Priya. Thanks, Jed. Um, just wanted to make sure that people are aware that the full teaching portfolio is required for anybody on the tenure track. So um, I think there may have been some misunderstanding about that, but the abridged teaching portfolio, which is where you only need one of those, either the self-assessment, the peer assessment, and the student assessment, again, only applies to term faculty going up for reappointment and continuing appointment without promotion. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and we can answer in, in a minute, but I'm just going to ask you, Priya, to check out Garrett's question in the chat. Um, sure. Uh, Let's see. And I think that actually transitions into our next slide about, oh, no, I was wrong. <laughs> it takes one more slide. My apologies, Priya. We'll come back to it. Um, I'm going to talk about the process of creating a portfolio. Um, so we have two different graphics here expressing the process. Um, so our first one is rather linear. Um, you might think, okay, I'll start by developing my teaching philosophy, my teaching statement. And then uh, after that, gather different evidence and artifacts to support the beliefs that you express in the statement, and then organize and arrange those contents into a portfolio. What we actually want to recommend is more of an iterative process. So, um, you know, wh where to begin, <laughs> that's really up to you. Um, but um, so you might start with writing a statement on the upper right and then gathering evidence and artifacts, but then you might write, look back and write summaries of what you have, gather more evidence and artifacts to see what's going to fit your portfolio and your theming of the portfolio better. And then write this an iterative process where you keep updating it, you keep editing it. So it's one of those sort of living documents, right? Or living um, sort of, uh, artifacts where you keep working on it, you keep updating it, um, you keep improving it. And it's going to take a while, you know, to craft the portfolio that you would like to turn in. So we want to emphasize that this is an ongoing process and that, you know, the first time around, we might get everything the way we want it to look. It might take a couple of drafts. All right. Anything else that we'd like to add here? Or we will talk about artifacts, yes. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Priya, to talk about currency in the field. Sure, great. great. Um, and I do want to address some of the questions that came up in the chat, because sometimes it's faster to speak them than to write them. Um, there is a limit to the teaching statement, and it has to do with what 
category of faculty you are. So it's shorter for somebody applying for a one-year reappointment, and it's longer for somebody applying for a multi-year continuing. Um, and on the on the tenure track side, there are also word limits associated with that. So I would definitely recommend people look at their checklists, um, which are provided by your faculty coordinator, and abide by what the checklist tells you um, as a good way to make sure it's right for what you're applying for. Um, Sorry, there's one other thing in the chat, which I can also come back to. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me come back to that. I'll talk through this slide. Um, okay, so currency in the field um, under the omnibus guidelines, um, it's just to give people a background on what the omnibus guidelines are in case you don't know. The omnibus guidelines were created by the provost's office um, and they were meant to be used by any um, school or academic unit that wanted to adopt them fully. Um, they're meant to reflect not just what's necessary for term reappointment and continuing appointment, but they're also integrated with an emphasis on DEI elements um, and really Really, you know, this uh, idea of having public impact be a larger part of um, what we assess um, beyond, you know, traditional research outputs. Those things can be important for um, faculty that do research, but we're also looking at kind of widening what the qualifications are for um, for reappointment to, to make them more inclusive. Um, so the omnibus guidelines were adopted by many schools. Um, just to give you an idea, for example, College of Arts and Sciences (SOC). Um, OGPS, and then many of the schools have submitted their modifications to the omnibus guidelines. But um, these things will hold regardless of whether your school adopted the omnibus guidelines or whether your school made uh, adjustments to the omnibus guidelines. So I just want to preface what I'm saying with that. And if any of that's not clear, I'm happy to answer questions. So currency in the field very simply means staying up to date in one's professional and or scholarly area. Um, and yes, as some examples of this, you would want to demonstrate either one or more of the following things that you see listed on this on this slide. So conducting research, publishing, or contributing to the scholarly profile of the university. Now, again, this doesn't have to be part of your profile if you're not a research-focused um, faculty member. Um, professional practice can be something else you talk about, consulting work, for example, um, or membership in professional associations, um, participation in the scholarship of teaching and learning. So you know, CTRL events that you attend can be evidence of that, as well as maybe some external continuing education around how to be a better teacher. Um, your pedagogical innovations. So as you've made changes to your syllabi, you may want to refer to why you made those changes and how they reflect your evolving philosophy on your pedagogy. Um, and then lastly, your contributions to the development of diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racist practices, um, specifically that build community collaboration and civil discourse within your field. So if you advised, for example, um, a, a group of students um, from an uh, underrepresented background, um, if you contributed to um, new thinking in your field that encompasses views that were not previously um, part of the mainstream, those would be things you wanted to point to. But with all of these, you really want to bring it back to your teaching and you want to talk about how these activities have enriched your teaching and your student advising and mentoring. Let's see, there's a few questions in the chat. Lots happening in this chat. Okay, let's see. The conference of narrative is supposed to have a word. Okay, more on that. Okay, the teaching portfolio. Let me come back to that is and go through the rest of these slides so that I can make sure that we're staying on, on time. All right, so on the service piece, again, there's a real emphasis here on making sure that we're being more expansive in what we define as service. So um, service is understood as this, the, the um, service that you provide to your teaching unit, meaning your department, um, your academic unit, meaning your school, and then to the university as a whole. Um, so internal service should really be done at your the level that's appropriate to your rank and years at AU. So for somebody who is in their first year or in their first couple of years, we would accept, expect less service. Um, but as your time here increases and as you're, as you're more woven into the fabric of the university, we would expect that service to show some development and increase increase. Um, but it really can range from kind of low level service commitments like attending campus events, including things like graduation and preview days, 
um, all the way to, you know, your service on various committees, and then maybe your leadership in committees would be a nice progression to see on that, being a co-chair or a chair, or being the representative of your school or department, you know, to a larger body within the university. Your external service can include professional work in the community. So maybe you volunteer your time to be um, an advisor to a particular community organization. That's, you know, something else you can identify. Now, internal service is required. Um, external service is um, not required, but, you know, it's certainly something you should talk about if it's something that you participate in. Um, and then lastly, um, the tips on this, I would say, is that you want to highlight uh, your increasing levels of impact in your service. So when you're when you're talking about your service, you want to talk about how you've kind of grown your footprint of service at the university. You also want to make sure that you're clear about the level of time commitment and the depth of your involvement. So if you are in a service commitment that requires more time than you think um, is evident just by your title, um, it's important to kind of contextualize that and explain it. That can only benefit you. And then lastly, it's important to highlight your service to underserved um, communities because, again, this counts towards your, your DEI aspects of what you're doing in terms of your service. So those are, those are a couple of areas that I would highlight. Next slide, please. Oops. Okay. So we're at the chat check-in. Um, how are we doing in the chat? I just want to make sure we're, we're hitting on questions. Um, is there something that I need to answer in this chat. Um, there are a few about the um, teaching statement and I've been trying to answer most of the questions in the chat. Maybe I'll go back to the slide where we introduced this. So, um, and then Priya, you can follow up if, if what I'm saying isn't correct, but the, so the comprehensive narrative has that word limit and has to include the teaching, the service and the currency in the field but the teaching portfolio has your teaching statement, which Mary Catherine is going to go into more detail about. When we say pull from the comprehensive narrative, that doesn't mean that it can only be what you put in the comprehensive narrative under the teaching section, but you might pull from there and then expand upon that. And you have a little bit more space to give more examples um, and more detail in this teaching statement. So we're encouraging you to, these should be aligned and they should be, um, you know, pulling from that comprehensive narrative, but you have more space in the teaching portfolio. Right, exactly. Um, you've got that. You've got that exactly right. You don't have to do it um, a cut and paste. And Robert had asked a message about uh, asked a question about the difference between a set and a student assessment. So the set is obviously the summary of the numerical part of what your students have commented on. Of course, nobody sees your narrative unless you share the narrative. So other forms of student assessment would be for you to voluntarily decide to share your narratives. If you share your narratives, you have to share all the narratives for a particular class. You can't. Um, you can't select, you know, to only show the best ones. You would have to select all of the narratives um, to share as part of evidence of student assessment. But you might also look at maybe organizing a group of students who are not in your, um, who are not your students to do an observation of a class, but that's a little bit more involved. We often think that the narratives is a kind of easier way for you to share student assessment that is not the sets. I hope that answers that. Um, and then Bill had a question about artifacts. Um, so artifacts are just the pieces of evidence um, that you would point to. So impacts or outcomes that you would point to in terms of your, um, your teaching impacts. Okay. Does that cover it or have I missed something? So yeah. Yeah. And I think every all of these questions we will cover in more detail in the coming slides. And then we do have time at the end for any still unanswered questions. <laughs> that may be better. Um, so now we'll transition into talking about more about the teaching statement as part of the portfolio. So at this section. Um, let's take a minute to regroup and think specifically about the teaching statement, um, which is an outline of your philosophy plus more. So as we're thinking about that, I'd love to hear what words you would you would use to describe your goals as an instructor. So if you could take, we'll take like just 30 seconds on this, put it into the chat and see what everyone thinks of.
principals as instructors. Impact of direction from Robert on of students' professional careers, being encouraging, ensuring students meet learning objectives um, to the highest of their potential. I don't know. Inclusive. Um, trust, empathy, creativity, creativity and critical thinking. Um, all of these sound like great goals. Um, and all of these are things that we can talk about in um, when we talk about our teaching in a teaching statement. So um, the, we'll go over just some details potential formats, that sort of thing now. Um, in a nutshell, a teaching philosophy statement or a teaching statement, it goes by a lot of different names, is a brief document in which you articulate your beliefs about teaching and learning, along with examples of how you enact those beliefs in the classroom. Um, you really want to depict what it looks like to be your student based on your teaching philosophy. It's the foundation of your teaching portfolio and the themes you articulate in the teaching statement should be visible throughout the documents as they as as these themes inform the strategies you adopt in your classes. So because of its personal nature of the teaching statement, they're written as narratives in first person voice typically. So I, um, the reader is interested in why you um, care about teaching, what you hope your students will gain from classes, what taking a class with you might be like, and it overall provides a clear and unique portrait of you as a teacher. So you want to avoid generic or empty philosophical statements about teaching. It's typically one to two pages, um, single spaced, but it depends on context as we were mentioning. So look at your checklist if you have specific requirements on American. Um, generally, you can think about um, if you're going up for tenure and people are definitely reading it, there's you want to really use that full space if you are maybe applying for an adjuncting job or applying for a job outside of American. For if there, I don't know if there are any graduate students or adjuncts in the group, but um, then you might want to keep it on the shorter side because people will be reading those quickly. Um, next slide, please. I see another question in the chat. Maybe Priya won't can confirm with, in terms of the length of the teaching statement, what are we looking for? Yeah, I think they generally are going to be relatively short. You know, they are an extraction um, of something that you're saying in your comprehensive narrative in the sense that the comprehensive narrative gives you a chance to say everything within the word limit. And the teaching statement is really more of kind of your philosophy piece. On the word limit, um, yeah, I have to look, I have to go back and look if I could get back to you all on that. I do think that there is some word limit on it based on the type of position that you're going up for. So, um, I can't answer that right at this moment, but I promise that I will come back to you when we do the follow-up materials and answer that question. Thanks, Maria. So, um, Thinking again about the components of the teaching statement now, there's many different ways to structure it. We'll offer one um, common structure in a little bit, but the, generally what you want to include is a declaration of your beliefs. What are your values concerning um, teaching and learning? Then an explanation of the instructional strategies you employ to enact those beliefs. What does that look like in your classroom? Then we have your assessment of the impact of your instructional strategies. So. How do you know that your learners have been successful in meeting these goals that you have for them? And what are your goals for the future? How do you want to improve based on that assessment you've done? Um, we have a worksheet to support you in brainstorming for your teaching statement and planning the rest of your portfolio. And we'll share that at the end of the session. But for now, let's talk a little more about each of these components and what guiding questions you might ask yourself as you prepare to write. Next slide, please. So, this here's one typical kind of structure that you can use. Begin with an introductory paragraph. You introduce yourself, your discipline, the types of courses you've taught. Um, you want to hook the reader and briefly introduce your beliefs. You can also include a brief roadmap here um, for people who might be reading it more quickly. 
Um, then you'd follow with three to four body paragraphs, one for each belief. Um, again, this is just one option for structuring it. Start with your belief and support it with evidence of your strategies and impact. So you want concrete examples from your teaching practice. Help your student, help your reader see what it's like to be your student. Um, think about what makes your teaching impactful. What are you doing? What are your students doing? And then finally conclude with a brief paragraph summarizing your main points, tying everything together, potentially sharing future goals. Um, I recommend keeping the conclusion fairly brief to focus most of the statement on those body paragraphs and showing really clearly what your beliefs look like for you. Um, again, though, this is just one option and the, the structure is fairly reliable, but um, also reading essay after essay in the same format can be tedious for your readers. So if you feel up to devising your own structure, um, you may have an easier time attracting the reader's attention or making that um, depiction more compelling. But just be sure you don't omit any of your statement's key components in that process. So you can get a little more creative, but still include those four um, elements in that pie chart we saw earlier. And keep in mind that the more creative or aesthetically driven essays do risk losing your point. So we, you want to have that balance. OK, what not to include? You should avoid vague statements. I mentioned this, but a vague statement like lecturing is bad or active learning is good. Um, those don't tell us a lot about your teaching and they have so many qualifications, they're not really useful. Um, you don't wanna include any unsupported claims. So if you make claims about the effectiveness of your teaching, you wanna back that up with evidence from evaluations or student feedback or grades changes in grades, that kind of thing. Um, you also don't want to speak poorly of your students, but frame um, frame everything in terms of improving student success. Another point that um, we like to make is not to use an overabundance of citations. This isn't a researched argument, it's a personal statement. So I kind of recommend no more than two or three citations. Um, many strong statements don't have any and then also avoid summarizing your CV. So this isn't the place to list like the level of detail of a course number necessarily. Um, but again, thinking about your big principles and what they look like. Um, so yeah, a, a well-written teaching philosophy statement should be specific, positive, asset-based, and personal. Um, so just an overview of our key takeaways here. When drafting your teaching philosophy statement, be sure to include your beliefs, strategies, impact, and goals, those four areas, in your statement. Back up your claims with rich examples from your experience to show how that looks, that they're not just ideas in your head, but you enact them in your classroom. And don't be afraid to personalize the structure of the document. So if you were assigned to read it, would you find it interesting? Um, I think I'll pass it over to Hannah now. Do we have any other questions in the chat from my folks? Yeah, so maybe just save the questions for the end. All right, thank you. So one last chance to check in as we transition from the teaching statement into those three different categories for assessment, self, peer, and student. Um, we're curious, how do you currently assess your teaching or what evidence, maybe artifacts do you have that your teaching is effective and impactful? What are you already doing so that we can hopefully build off of that and show you how that can fit into your portfolio and which category it might cover? Of course, the, the SETs, student evaluations of teaching, regularly reviewing them, comparing notes. That. So working together to think about things you might change at Zoom polls with sur survey questions. So a nice ongoing informal feedback, mid-semester check-ins, unsolicited comments, emails from first alum. Yeah, all of these things are different ways to assess different aspects of your teaching. And we'll talk about which ones might fit into the portfolio as part of these artifacts or how to um, exhibit these in your portfolio. 
Right. And some of these things that are a little bit more informal, maybe if they aren't actual artifacts, they still are um, things that you could write about in your teaching statement, like frequent check-ins with students or extended contact with students. Those are things you could write, as Mary Catherine said, as evidence of the impact of your strategies when you're writing your teaching statement. Right. So as mentioned at the start, in terms of what AU um, as, uh, considers as assessment for your teaching and the three different categories that you will be putting evidence into are self-assessment, peer assessment, and student assessment. So we'll go through all of these and some options for each. So options for um, that self-assessment category. So a first option would be a summary of your professional development activities. And I have a slide on that next. So that would be kind of writing up an, your own narrative on all the ways you've engaged in professional development related to teaching or mentorship and or mentorship. Uh, an annotated syllabus or course material. So we have a resource on this. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat. But essentially, annotating your syllabus or course materials would look like you taking the document that is your syllabus or um, say a an assignment description and then writing comments on that. So I these learning outcomes were designed for X, Y, and Z reasons, or this is my participation policy because X, Y, and Z, or I included a um, an equity statement in my syllabus because, or just basically talking the reader through the reasoning behind all of your decisions in your syllabus or in another course material. Um, but the link I put in the chat gives a lot more information on that. You could write a narrative of a change changes made to a course, especially if you went through a really significant course redesign or a course or even a curriculum development process, um, and then a written self-evaluation of teaching. So that would be, um, say, you maybe have a recording of yourself teaching or an observation or way to kind of observe yourself teaching and then evaluate how you did based on um, things. So in terms of professional development, if you're writing up a self-assessment of your professional development, you might include workshops and webinars like CTRL events, any consultations you've done, conferences you've attended, conferences you've presented at, if you've done mentorship, so formal supervision or informal collaborations, um, writing references and letters of recommendation. These are all things to mention and any awards you've gotten for teaching, whether they were fellowships or other awards, departmental, campus-wide, so on and so forth. So this will look different for everyone. It's a kind of a catch-all category. It can change completely based on your experiences. Some of you may even have um, presentations and publications related to teaching. So it can make this work for you. When it comes to peer assessment, there are a few options. So you might do or include a peer observation, and that could be for a live course or a recorded course. So if you're teaching online or if you have recordings of when you've taught um, during the pandemic even, um, you could have a peer observe that or observe you live and um, provide feedback and write that up. So we also have uh, a very detailed guide on our website about how to go about peer assessment. Uh, and same thing with peer review of course materials that's similar to the self-assessment annotated syllabus, but this time you're handing your syllabus or you're handing an ass assignment or some other course materials or a lesson plan that you did to a peer and asking them to write comments. So they might be writing um, things that they you know, appreciate and or um, would suggest changing for the future. And then lastly, the options for student assessment. And I know a lot of questions came up about these in the chat earlier. So I think the most common option for the student assessment category was the student comments from SETs. I see a broken link that might be because we updated this. So it might've changed what the link is. So Mary Catherine or Shed can put the, the newest peer assessment guidance link in there. Um, yeah, so the options for student assessment, the most common one would be the student comments from the SETs. So the, the qualitative responsive or the narrative responses from your SETs, because as mentioned before, the numerical SETs will all go into your, um, will be submitted by OIRA, but you can choose for student assessment to also include the narrative portions of your SETs. And I believe the what we have here, and again, this is something to double check or departments may have different preferences, 
but you're expected to submit all of the narrative responses for one class per year. So pick one class each year that you've been teaching. Um, another option is self-administered student feedback surveys. And I'll, I have a slide on that next. So that would be if you are giving your own um, anonymous survey at the mid-semester point, for example, and um, collecting all of that data and then summarizing that, including that. Um, student emails or letters um, are definitely a great option for student assessment, but may or may not count as um, your one artifact. So that is something to check with your department, but we do encourage you to include those as additional evidence or artifacts. And then a student feedback discussion led by a colleague. So for example, CTRL does the mid-semester course analyses, which is um, we come in and do a formal focus group session with your students and then write up a report and debrief that with you. Um, so that would be a great option to include here. And as Priya is saying in the chat, I think for any of these categories, checking with your individual schools and departments on whether they have preferences on what you submit. So we're giving you a lot of options here, but not necessarily um, pointing you to any specific ones, but that might be something you decide on based on what's expected of you or what your preferences are. Oh, and then a question about how many years you've been teaching. So Priya, let everybody know that you'd go back six years maximum, depending on what type of reappointment. So just a little bit more detail about student self-administered feedback for the student assessment portion. So if you do choose to self-administer some type of mid-semester survey or whatnot, um, to include it in your portfolio, you would wanna make sure that feedback is anonymous and that you're including all of the feedback from a collection, collection session, not just the positive feedback. So that you have a way to say, here's the survey I gave, here's how I made sure it was anonymous, and here are all of the results. So it's even more helpful if you have a TA or GA to administer that survey, or if you don't, that you um, administer the survey and then leave the room so that students feel that it is anonymous. Um, you could include questions about what is going well, as well as what could be improved. And we recommend at least these three questions. What is helping you learn? What is getting in the way of your learning? What suggestions do you have to improve learning? And we have again, another resource on this aspect. Um, and this, if you're thinking about next semester, could be something you do um, at the beginning towards the middle of the semester. Right, so we're going to drop that planning document in the chat. And then I think for the remainder of the session, we have time for any uh, additional questions. So we created, as one of my colleagues will drop in the chat this document, we've created a short worksheet to help you develop your teaching portfolio. So that first page is a teaching statement brainstorming. So with those four categories of belief, strategies, impact, and future goals, we have some sample prompts or reflection questions to get you thinking. So you might use this um, to help you brainstorm what you want to put in your statement. And then the second page is just a, a kind of document to help you organize when you might wanna collect these different artifacts or evidence pieces to put in the assessment portion of your portfolio. And then there are also tons of links and resources on this document. So example teaching statements, um, example portfolios and other places we, we've pulled some of this information from and we recommend you go for, for more examples because every, every discipline is different, every field is a little bit different. So it's really helpful to look for very specific examples um, in your field, whether they're from this campus or other campuses. So that's now in the chat and then we'll switch over to this slide, but really we have about 10 minutes uh, before we wrap up for what questions do you have about the teaching portfolio that any of us could answer? I'm thinking about also reflecting on what do you plan to include? What do you already have? And what do you need to create or collect? And how will you go about doing so? So feel free to raise your hand or type anything into the chat that's still on your mind.
Yeah, Sonia? Just to clarify about the ranging back six years and one course, um, is that, um, let's say I teach two or three courses, uh, different courses each semester. So I pick one per semester. Yeah, so the answer to that would be that, you know, we would require in the Dean of Faculty's office to have one per semester as evidence of your um, student assessment that's non-numerical, mm -hmm. but your department or your school might have some different parameters for what they expect. So that's why I was saying do check with them and mm -hmm. see, you know, what is, do they have any standards around what they're expecting you to provide in terms of non-numeric student assessment? Got it. Thanks. Sure. There's questions in the chat. Um, Priya, this one might be good for you. Does undergraduate research mentoring fall into teaching or service? Mm, good question. I mean, I think it's up to you where you want to put it. Um, I, I could see the argument for both, but I would select one. And my advice generally would be wherever you feel like you want more content, um, wherever you feel like you might be a little lopsided in terms of your portfolio, like say you have a lot of service, then maybe you put it into teaching, right? Um, or your, you know, your teaching is, is outstanding and then you maybe want to put it under service. So I would kind of put it where it makes sense for you strategically. Um, and I saw Garrett's question. Okay, where did it go? seem to have lost it. Garrett, can you reiterate the question? Uh, sure, if it's okay for me to say it out loud. Um, it's just that some colleagues have not necessarily been organized with a teaching observation uh, and they still want to do it. But my sense is that based on the manual permits one to add some evidence after they submit the initial file for action. So is that seem correct in your view that they could still submit the file by their internal deadlines and then have the teaching observation added soon afterwards? Well, ideally we'd want everything to be complete before it goes to your um, various levels of approval within your department, right? So before it goes to your chair, before it goes to your dean, it should be complete. But what is true is that anything that's added to your file can only be added by you and you alone, right? So nobody else in the process, like your department chair, your dean can add something to your file um, you know, you you have to be the one to do that. I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but you know, in some cases there is flexibility around when things um, are received. So you know, we set the deadlines to ensure that there is enough time for all stages of review. But if there's ever any question about some component that is difficult to obtain, I would definitely just check in and ask. It's kind of like what we tell our students about extensions. We prefer not to give them, but if there is some kind of extenuating circumstance or some reason to consider it, it doesn't hurt to ask. Does that answer your question? Okay, here I am. All right, um, Michelle, please feel free to share your question. Yeah, mine is somebody who evaluates a ton of these files. So I'm gonna give that perspective. Um, and in response to Garrett's point, there is a process. Um, and yes, uh, faculty are allowed to add things, but bearing in mind, if a letter has already been drafted from your department chair, that letter is complete and gone. So if you're adding stuff, you know, three months out, you know, very few of the committees or evaluation is going to see it. So I would really emphasize Priya's point. I would also say that I saw the comment about research mentoring, um, anything like that from a faculty point of view, we would consider that that's absolutely, if you're research mentoring, really indicative of teaching beyond the classroom. And I think that's an important element. It's not really service because we are expected to mentor, write letters, and you know, I mean, but something like research mentoring is, you know, or serving on a Fulbright review board or something like that, doing an interview, that's something above and beyond your time in the classroom. And that takes extra effort. And to me, that fits much, much more 
the teaching part of the portfolio to demonstrate teaching beyond the classroom, as I call it, if that's any help for anybody. Thank you so much for that perspective, Michelle. I think those are some great points. There's a few hands up. Um, let's see, I don't know which what the order was, but um, Shireen. Thank you so much for um, all the information that you provided. I have a couple of questions. First of all, in the teaching part of the teaching narrative, the comprehensive one. Um, so you mentioned that you don't need to copy and paste from your teaching philosophy there. I also talked to my department and they mentioned that, you know, I need to explain how I contribute to the department. So, um, you know, including all of that information, so uh, should that, you know, uh, teaching part of the teaching portfolio uh, goes back to my um, philosophy a little bit and then, you know, I cover, you know, what I'm doing in the department and I how, how I can contribute there or, uh, you know, I don't know how to structure that part. That's one question that I have. And uh, the next question that I have is about the currency in the field part. And in my department, you know, guidelines, there is a part that they said that, you know, we need to mention that, you know, the presence on campus is the other thing that, you know, we have on that section other than service and, you know, a currency in the field. Um, so I don't know, I need to have a, uh, you know, separate section on the teaching, uh, you know, comprehensive, you know, um, narrative one, or I need to have just, you know, explain them all together, you know, as, you know, one, one thing. If you can clarify that, that would be great. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, okay. I'll try my best. So there was a lot there, but I think that, I think that your departmental impact can actually come out in a couple of different ways. So obviously you can talk about how you contribute to the scholarship and the teaching of the department. And, you know, those things would obviously fall under your teaching, but you might also want to comment on how you contribute to service in the department. So for example, if you're on any task forces or committees that are department specific, or you represent the department to either the school or the university level, um, you may want to mention that as well. Um, and that would probably fall under your service um, part of your teaching narrative. So that's part one. On the current on the campus presence, yes, that is something that is in the omnibus guidelines. And I would think that that's something that would be fairly evident by um, the number of classes taught and office hours um, that you have on campus, as well as maybe some other ways that you're involved with service at the university. I don't know that you need to speak to that specifically, unless somebody has told you that you need to, because I think people would have a pretty good sense of whether or not you are maintaining a campus presence based on whether you were showing up to teach your classes um, and whether you were holding office hours. So that's just my my view on it. But, you know, I welcome other perspectives um, before we move on to the next question. I don't know if anybody has anything to add there. Does that help, Shireen? It does. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Uh, Maya? Hi, thank you. Um, I have one small technical question that I know that you answered twice, but I'm still not 100% clear. And then I have a slightly broader question. The technical question is just about that um, with the narrative portions of the SETs, the student comments. I know you said one class per year. Do you mean a total of one course per year and can it be the same course every year? Are you required to submit, if, if you're submitting that, are you required to submit for every year that you've been teaching? Um, if you could just um, give a little bit more uh, guidance on that. And then the other question I have is just about, um, I'm, I'll be going up for third year reappointment and um, I'm just curious about what degree of overlap there can be between those materials and then the materials that one puts up for tenure in the sense, you know, obviously I would revise the materials to some degree, but can I reuse some of those assessments and things? 
Yeah. So I'll start with your second question first. Um, I, the guidance for anything that's for pre-tenure review, I would definitely look at the CFA DOF memo, but you can obviously take what you've produced for other reasons. And this holds true for things like merit packages um, and um, those, those other types of assessments and reuse them in a way that, you know, would work for um, the demands of whatever um thing you're applying for, if that makes sense. So, you know, the CFA DOF memo has some specific things in it, but your checklist also has some specific things in it, but can you repurpose things? Absolutely. And I would definitely encourage that because it'll be a big time saver. Um, on your first question regarding the, um, the non-numeric um, student evaluations, yeah, I mean, I think we, at least in the Dean of Faculty's office, are not specific about which course you choose and whether you use the same course year after year. Um, we wanted it to not be overly onerous and have you supply teaching narratives for every class that you've taught because that could get to be a very fat file very quickly. Um, and so the idea here is for you to kind of put your best foot forward and select the course that you think best represents your narratives, best represents you in terms of the narrative comments that you've received. Um, so it would be one course per year that you taught all the narrative comments for that course. So again, not picking and choosing, but the comprehensive narratives for that one course. I hope that answers it. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, I think we're out of time. Oh, but I see one more question from Suleiman. Yeah. Um, yes, please go ahead. It is a very simple question, maybe. Uh, so if I am teaching one course, but more than one session of the same course, uh, can I just choose one session by, or do I, do I have to submit all of these sessions? No, one section is fine. So you're saying you're teaching multiple sections of the same course. Do you have to submit all sections? Yeah. No, just one section, one class. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, I think that's all the questions. Um, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, I wanna turn it back to Hannah and Shed to close us out. Thanks, Priya. And so I know that folks may have more questions. So uh, I don't know how much time you have, Priya, but we can hang out for just a couple of minutes to make sure we answer those. Lindsay has also put